right, y'all. Go ahead and join me. We're going to be in John chapter 10. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I'm going to apologize to you all and to myself because, uh, man, we're doing verses 1 through 21 today. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I've always tried to stick to just like a small portion, uh, you know, maybe something like five to seven verses at a time. And, and, you know, that works. And then sometimes I just get so caught up in a story. I'm just like, man, like, I mean, we got to talk about all this. And then next thing you know, I look at my notes and then I'm about to start preaching. I'm like, how am I going to get through all this? So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go back to doing smaller chunks after this. But uh, that's what we're doing today. John 10, 1 through 21. Uh, I titled today's message, The Good, The Bad, and The Indifferent. Uh, so go ahead and get there. John 10, 1 through 21. I'm going to be reading from the CSB version, reading and teaching from the CSB version. While you're getting there, you know, I got some good reflecting time in uh, while preparing this week. And, uh, you know, since becoming a pastor, which, you know, wasn't a lifelong career goal for me, um, uh, man, I've always had a certain me a certain measure of um, fear and discomfort associated with this role um, because, man, it's not where I expect it to be. I don't think this is, I can't look back 10 years ago and say, man, this is, this is, this is my plan or this is where I think the Lord is going to have me be. Um, you know, I was con content, you know, I, I was doing well climbing the corporate ladder, you know, and for some reason, uh, God saw fit to pull me from that and throw me into pastoral ministry. And man, it's uncomfortable. I feel awkward sometimes. I feel fear. I feel discomfort. And a part of that is that I can feel y'all feeling me out. Y'all know what I'm trying to say? It's like, man, when, when, especially when you're, when you're planting a new church, man, people, there's, there's a certain measure of scrutiny of, 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 of focus, of, of assessment and reassessment that's kind of always happening, and I can feel it. And it's, it's, it's almost like when, you, you know, you ever go to somebody's house and the only chair that's left is that one with the wobbly leg, and they got to they gotta look at it a little bit first before they decide if they're going to sit on it, they got to touch it, they got to poke it, they got to push it. And then maybe when they get comfortable enough to maybe sit on it a little bit, they're like, well, do, can, I, can I put all my weight on this or is the bottom going to drop out if I put my trust in this thing? And so some of being a pastor feels like being that chair where people are coming close and they're like, oh, you know, it does look like a comfy chair, but let me, let me. You know, it does have a wobbly leg. Is it going to be okay? Can I rest here or is the bottom going to fall out? And so, man, there's a, a, it's just an awareness that I have, man, of, of people feeling this thing out and feeling uh, uh, me as a pastor and a leader out and, and, in some, and, and, and comparing me as the man of God, the preacher, uh, to what the scriptures say I should be. And praise God, you should be doing that. All right. And then there's also, uh, man, the comparison of, man, who, who is, who is this pastor and, 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 and maybe comparing me to your past pastors, maybe pastors that served you well, or maybe pastors that didn't serve you well. All right. Maybe there's some trepidation, like, man, uh, we, we, we left this situation to seek out a better situation. And, 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 and man, I need to be really careful. I need to feel this guy out and these leaders out, uh, to see if I'm at risk of, experiencing similar hurts or failings. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I think it's really natural to do. I've done it. And if anything, I'm just saying I can feel it as the person who's being looked at and assessed. And can I trust this guy? I can feel that. And so it made me wonder just in general, man, how trusted is the office of pastor in America today. And so, man, that led me, you know, to the old trusty Google. And I fin ended up on the uh, Gallup poll uh, website, right? And you know Gallup polls, they do, they're the ones who do all the big political polls that you know where things are trending and stuff like that. So, you know, I don't know, it depends on how much you trust them or not. But interesting data on the Gallup website from 2023, the number one most trusted profession in America, uh, and so they had five categories essentially of trust, uh, very low, low, 
uh, neutral, and then you had high and very high. And so in terms of the number one trusted profession in America, uh, uh, where people rated that profession as high or very high trust is nurses. Nurses are the most trusted profession in America at 78% of people rating their trust for nurses at high or very high. To get to clergy, you have to go all the way down to number 11. So pastors are ranked number 11, and that 78% drops all the way down to 32%. 32% of Americans consider pastors and clergy as people who are worthy of high or very high trust, people who have high or very high ethical standards. And I was sitting here thinking, man, so think about how much you trust your nurse, cut it in half, and you still trust your pastor less than that. That was sobering, man. And and unfortunately, as I reflected on that, we got to be honest. Throughout the course of history, going all the way back to the church that we read about in the Bible, there has always been a mix of good leaders, bad leaders, and indifferent leaders. Always. As a matter of fact, when we think about leadership, the very first leader in the Bible is Adam, and he jacked it up. (laughs) so this goes way back it goes back as far as it can go that man god has entrusted certain responsibilities to man and i don't just mean mankind i do mean men when you think about the office of elder and pastor in the church it's reserved for qualified men but unfortunately with that that means all of your failings are going to come from men and so we see that in the garden We see it in the Old Testament synagogues. We see it in the New Testament churches. And we see it today. And so, like I said, there have been good leaders, bad leaders, indifferent leaders. And in today's passage, Jesus addresses this issue head on. Let's read together again, John 10, 1 through 21. I'm reading through this uh, from the CSB. I'll read. You can follow along. It says, truly, I tell you, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens it for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought all his own outside, he goes ahead of them. The sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger. Instead, they will run away from him because they don't know the voice of strangers. Jesus gave them this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Jesus said again, truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, but I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. And again, the Jews were divided because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon, and he's crazy. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, aren't these 
uh, these aren't the words of someone who is demon possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? And so just to kind of bring us back into the context, maybe if you weren't here last week, uh, so uh, in the previous chapter, the way chapter 9 ended, uh, the Pharisees uh, had uh, interrogated the man who was healed of his blindness by Jesus. They even interrogated his parents, all right? And they were doing everything they could to kind of discredit what Jesus had done and who Jesus is. Uh, They called into question whether the man ever was truly blind or whether this was some type of hoax that was being played. I don't know how he pretended to be blind his whole life, but they didn't believe it. And so they put this rule into place that anyone who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah was to be banned from the synagogue. And so this is what ends up happening. The, the blind man, after continued questioning and interrogation, uh, he doesn't back down from his story. He, he continues to give Jesus the credit for what he's done. And the blind man, or the formerly blind man, is now banished from the synagogue. And that is to be banished from the whole community of faith. He's kicked out. And then afterwards, Jesus finds him. He asks him if he believes in the Son of Man. He tells him that he's looking at the Son of Man, and he worships him, and Jesus receives the worship. And so what ends up happening with these Pharisees, after they kicked this man out of the synagogue, essentially they're flexing their authority. They're they're, they're saying, we're the ones in charge. Uh, We are the ones who get to say who's in and who's out, of the household of God. What we say goes. You're in if we say you're in, and you're out if you say, if, if we say you're out. And this is what happens to the blind man, and it's important to keep uh, this immediate context in mind because this illustration that Jesus is giving about the sheep and the sheep pen and the shepherds and the gatekeepers and the hired help, all these things, all of this is in direct response to this false flex of authority from these Pharisees. So the illustration is connected to that event, the, the, the kicking out of the blind man from the synagogue. Who are they? Do they have the authority to say who is and who isn't allowed in God's family? And we know that they're still, they still have this in mind because if you go all the way to our last verse today, verse 21, after Jesus gets done sharing this illustration, they say, these aren't the words of someone who is demon possessed. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? So it's still couched in that context of Jesus healing the blind man. Something that's going to help us understand Jesus's illustration is looking back to ancient practices of shepherding or sheep keeping. Uh, We don't, uh, they didn't do it then the way it's done now. They didn't do it in that culture the way it's done now. And I can't say I fully understand how it's done now, but now we have technology and, 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 and there's, man, tons of, of, of land oftentimes and, and people use sheep dogs and all types of stuff to, to herd and to gather and to lead and all this stuff. And it just didn't look like that back then. Uh, often in many communities, especially if they were poorer communities, uh, when people had sheep, they didn't have like a thousand sheep. You may have been the shepherd of like five sheep. And so you may have had communities of many shepherds who had little pockets of sheep. And one of the ways that they would care for these sheep was in a communal pen. Uh, they kind of pooled their resources. What they would, would do is, is this community of shepherds, and everybody might have had their small little individual flocks of sheep, instead of each of these shepherds saying, okay, well, I got to buy land, and I got to buy a pen, and then I've got to get help and, and all this stuff. Instead, they just built one big pen that was adequate to hold all of their little flocks. And at the end of the day, the shepherds would lead their sheep to that big communal pen, and then they would pool their resources, and they would hire a gatekeeper, so they only had to have one gatekeeper, and then they had hired help, somebody to maybe feed the sheep, or water the sheep, or tend to the sheep, just look after them overnight while people were sleeping. And so they pooled their resources, and they had one big communal pen, and this is one of the common ways that some of the poorer shepherding communities would take care of their sheep. 
And so all of the sheep from various little flocks would be together in this pen. And then when the shepherd would return the next day, or maybe if they were gone for a prolonged period of time, uh, the shepherd would come to get his sheep. And the gatekeeper, part of his job isn't just to open and close the gate, but it's actually to recognize the shepherd and say, ah, shepherd, you have returned. Let me open the gate so you can come and get your sheep. They don't belong to me. They're yours. I got to recognize the shepherd and open the gate. And so, uh, and then the shepherd would enter in. And now here's the deal. Because the shepherd know the sheep and the sheep know their shepherd's voice, he could walk in to this communal pen of all types of different sheep, but his sheep would know his voice. He would call out to them and the shepherds would, would separate themselves from all of the sheep that weren't his and they would come out and then he would go before them and he would lead them out of the gate. And this was a common way that shepherding was done. There were other ways, but this is one of the common ways. And so... Let's explore this illustration. Again, Jesus kind of gives us a lot of characters. Hopefully we got time to get through all of them, but but he mentions robbers and thieves. Uh, He he mentions the gate. He personifies himself as the gate. Uh, There's a gatekeeper, there's sheep, there's the good shepherd, and then there's the hired help. All right, and so first, man, let's look at these thieves and robbers. Uh, uh, 10 verse one, he says, truly I tell you, anyone, excuse me, Anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber, right? Now, we've already read, Jesus says, I'm the gate. So he says, if anybody comes into the pen by any other way other than through the gate, through me, this person is a robber and a thief. And so these are people, whether they're leaders or whether they're wolves or whoever they are, these are people who think that they can get in to the household of God, into the family of God. They can get in by some other way other than Christ. There's got to be another way, but there isn't another way. Jesus says, I'm the gate. And anyone who doesn't come in through me is a thief and a robber. That's what he says. Now, generally speaking, only shady people will try to come in and avoid your front door. All right? I've never seen a a, a good friend just climb through my window. (laughs) Never had that. Now, I I, I have been, I don't know if you've ever been on the other side of a robbery attempt. Unfortunately, I've been on the other side of multiple. And, man, it's always something shady and unexpected. They come out of nowhere. You guys are probably like, man, what kind of life did this guy live? Yeah, I lived in some, you know, some crazy places, all right? But with their words and actions, they're telling you that there's got to be some other way in here besides the door, besides the gate. I can, I can bypass the gate. And in the, in the spiritual sense, there's got to be some other way into the household, into the family of God besides Jesus, And it's not true. So anyone who who moves like this, who talks like this, who tries to communicate this to you, that there's got to be some other way to get around Jesus and still get to God, this person is a robber and a thief. Man, this this reminds me, I I, I couldn't help but think of, uh, man, if you ever used to watch that old sitcom, Martin, you remember remember Bruh Man? Man, raise your hand if you know Bruh Man from Martin. Anybody? Come on, don't act too holy like you don't know Bruh Man from Martin. All right, now Bruh Man, now in, in his whole, that show was probably like seven seasons long, and Bruh Man never came through the front door. The first, the first interaction with Bruh Man was, was, was uh, Martin found him in his house, eating food from his refrigerator and wearing his bathrobe. And he's like, how'd you get in here, man? And he, he's like, I came through the fire escape. <laughs> And Martin was ready to fight. And this became an ongoing joke throughout the course of the whole series of the show that Bruh Man never came through the door. He always came through the window when you least expected it, luckily. And he was, actually, he was a robber and a thief. He was a friendly one, but he was a robber and a thief. (laughs) Never came through the front door. But 
this is who they are. This is who these robbers and thieves are. Anyone who would try to come through the side door, anyone who would try to climb over a wall, anybody who would try to find some other way into the family of God and say, you can get into God's family without actually going through the gate, without actually going through Jesus. That person is a robber. That person is a thief. That person means you harm. You know, unfortunately, there are well-known pastors today that won't see, to preach and teach the simple truth that Jesus is the only way to God. They will stand in pulpits and open the Bible and not teach you from it. <laughs> it's sad. But there's leaders like that. But Jesus is telling us that there's leaders like that. And he's telling them that there's robbers and there's thieves. And if anybody's telling you that there's another way in to God's family apart from Christ, man, these people mean you harm. And we know that Jesus is the way. How do we know? Well, Jesus said himself that he is the way, not a way. He said, I am the way. There's not another way. And then he goes on to say, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And so this is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. The Pharisees were saying not to trust Jesus and that there's another way. The, Jesus is, is present and he's doing his thing and, and people are starting to believe in him and they're saying, pay him no mind. We're the ones who can tell you how to really get to God. You don't need him to get into God's family. This is what the Pharisees are telling Jesus to his face and telling everyone in his face to disregard him. Listen to us instead. There's another way. There are other ways for you to get to the Father apart from Jesus. Can't help but think about these guys, man. Just, just how like blind and dismissive they had to be to look at Jesus and go, man, no, nah, there's got to be somebody else. There's, there's, there's got to be some other way to get into the presence of God, to be in the family of God, to be a member of the household of faith. There's got to be some other way. So what? He turned water into wine and, and, and fed 5,000 and walked on the water and, and, and healed the official son, long distance, didn't even show up for that one. Uh, 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 what else? Healed a paralyzed man, healed a blind man. Uh, and then not only did he do these things, he had his identity verified by John the Baptist. And, oh, he had his identity verified by his father and the spirit at his baptism and so what that all of this was documented by eyewitnesses it's got to be some other way absolutely absurd they're saying he's not the way even with all of this evidence all the evidence i've given you we're only in john chapter 10 we're only halfway through and the evidence is already overwhelming so beware Beware of thieves and robbers of your faith. They will come to you and they will offer you some type of alternative route. Think about, think about it about that, like that annoying voice you hear in your GPS, rerouting. Like, nah, we don't want that. <laughs> I don't want the prescribed route. All right, beware. Beware of alternate routes. The, the way is narrow. Be, uh, uh, watch out for, for, for bootleg bishops and pulpit pimps who will offer you everything but Jesus. Who will offer you health and wealth and prosperity and everything else but Jesus. Beware. They're offering you something other than him and his way. They're robbers and thieves. Let's look at the hired hand. The hired hand, verse 12. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he's a hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. And so, man, hired hands, man, these are... Uh, uh, the indifferent leaders. Don't get me wrong, sometimes you just got some straight up robbers and thieves. You got some straight up people that mean you harm. And you got other people, man, who are in leadership positions, and man, it's just a job. That's scary to me. 
In some ways, it's a little bit more scary. I think the, the wolves are sometimes a little bit more easy to spot than the indifferent hired hand. Because the end, with, the, with the hired hand, man, everything's going to be all good until it's not. When things get tough, they're going to dip out on you. They're going to run off. So these are phony leaders. They might not even realize they're phony themselves because they ain't been tested yet. But these are phony, indifferent, often lazy leaders. These, these, these hired hands are like, man, if you, if you get on... Uh, on the internet nowadays, man, there's plenty of videos. Depending on uh, what state you live in, they've, they've got different uh, uh, laws for like theft and stuff like that. I don't know if you've been watching these videos, but in some of these places, man, you can steal up to like $500 of merchandise a day, and it's like not enforceable in that city. Have y'all seen any of that stuff? Hey, man, who's the hired hand? The hired hand, man, the hired hand, the bad hired hand? Man, it's like these people, man, they're just working at Walgreens and just, just people just robbing them. They're like, man, it's not my stuff. Hopefully they got insurance for this. And people just come in and they're smashing and grabbing and, and whatever. You ever seen an employee when somebody's getting robbed versus the owner of the business when they're getting robbed? Man, they'll shoot you over a stick of bubble gum. Because <laughs> the difference is it's not mine. It don't belong to me. It's no personal loss to me. I'm not about to risk anything for this stuff. And unfortunately, there are men in leadership positions in church who are no more than hired hands, who, who've, who've been in ministry so long, who it's become their, 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 their way of living, their, their way of taking care of their families. They, you know what I'm saying? They don't, some of them don't even believe the Bible no more. But I got to stay because this is where I get my check. And they've got the degrees, and they sound good, and they, all, they know the right things to say, and they can open the scriptures, and they can properly exegete the text, and they can do all these things unless things get bad. Then the hired hand runs off and leaves the sheep to fend for themselves. I'm not going to lay their life down for the sheep. You know, I, I, I had a couple, like I said, a couple different robbery experiences one time. It's when I was working at AT&T. Now, AT&T has a very strict policy. This was, year, this was probably over 15 years ago. But even back then, you know, they, they told us, hey, if you're ever getting robbed, just let it happen. All right? We got, we got insurance. We'll figure it out. All right? I'm like, okay. But, man, there's something personally about me that just couldn't let that slide, man. I, it just didn't feel right. I remember one time I'm in the store. This is in Burnsville, Minnesota. And like four Somalian dudes walk in. Uh, uh, Minnesota, the, the Twin Cities area, big Somali population. Um, they have a, a, a lot of programs for like Somali refugees and stuff like that. So this isn't an indictment on all Somalis. It's just part of the story. But these guys walked in, and I remember I'm helping a customer, and the customer looks, and these guys are like walking around. They're not really, you know, looking like they're buying anything. And the customer goes, he's looking he's like, know about this he's like hey uh you know if you need to stop helping me to go check on those guys i'll wait all right <laughs> and i'm like no i got you you know i'm helping you the most important customer is the customer right in front of me i'm gonna take care of you we're gonna get you done right like hey man i was i was i'm telling you i was a customer service guru i'm saying five stars all the time and uh so they're they're more alert than i am i'm focused on the customer that customer's looking around like man some may Something, something's a little off here. And so, man, I'm helping the customer. And, uh, man, all of a sudden, man, these guys just start grabbing everything, man. They just start ripping stuff off the walls and grabbing, man, smartphones, Blackberries, iPhone, all this stuff flying off the shelves, right? And, man, me and my coworker, we're just standing there just watching this happen. And I'm just so mad because I'm like, man, I literally, like, made, a, made the decision to say, like, I'm not going to, like, profile these guys. Like, I'm just, I'm just going to help this customer. It'll be all right. They're going to be good. I trusted them. And, man, they took advantage of my trust, man. I took it personally. And so I knew the policy. I'm not supposed to engage robbers, but I also took it personally. I felt personally disrespected, so I had to do something. And so uh, I knew where all the camera angles were <laughs> in the store. And so these guys ran out the store. And so I casually walked to the door. 
And then I knew if I get out the door and I just make a, a slight shift to the right, I'm no longer within the sight of the cameras. And so I casually walked to the door, just like I was going to look and see where they were going. As soon as I knew I was outside of the shot of the camera, I took off running. Bow. And I'm sprinting. Just whew. Now, keep in mind, this is back in my college football days. I was, I was, ugh, right? And so, <laughs> and so these guys, they had parked their car like, like two parking lots away because they didn't want to get their car spotted and stuff like that. And so, man, they didn't think anybody was coming because, you know, they, they got out the store and I slowly, you know, it took me a couple to get to the door. And man, this guy, he was out of shape. And so he's just holding a bunch of cell phones, walking down the parking lot. And then he finally, like, looks back and he just sees this massive black defensive end just coming at him, just, oh, oh. <laughs> Oh, man, the guy panicked, man. He's running with the phones. The phones are dropping all over the place. And then, uh, man, by the time I catch up to him, all the other guys are in the car. They're like, wait, make it in the car, make it in the car. <laughs> and, oh, man, he ends up getting in the car. But I got there quick enough to at least get the license plate and, uh, yeah, was able to get the word out. Turns out we were the second AT&T store they hit that day, and they ended up getting arrested on their way to go do it at another AT&T store. And, uh, but man, robbers. So that's one robbery story. Another time, man, I was chilling in my apartment in Frogtown. This is like, you know, you look up Frogtown in St. Paul area, not nice. And man, I guess some people have been scoping our apartment. I used to be a big into music production. So I always had big speakers and all this expensive music equipment and loud music was always coming from our apartment. And, uh, man, one day, I was home by myself. I think they just thought none of us were home. There's me and I had two roommates. I think they thought all of us were gone and I'm there by myself. And uh, man, I hear this banging, just like we had two doors and I hear the first door get kicked in, just pow, 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 right? And I'm just like, man, what's that? And then they run, they get to the second door. It's the main door, it's like my living room and then that door. And I just hear them just, just, just trying to kick the door in, just boom, I'm hearing all these bangs. And man, I jump up, I just grab the first thing I can grab. I had a guitar. I grabbed that guitar by the neck, flipped it upside down. I said, man, if you, if you get in here, I'm ready for you, right? And then they <laughs> just took off running, right? But the difference was, man, they were in my home. They're trying to get in my home. I was willing to fight. I didn't know what they had intended. I suspect that they were coming in to steal, destroy, and who knows, possibly kill. And so, man, the hired, the hired hand, man, if you have a hired hand that's, that's bad help, man, all they're going to do, as soon as they find a way out, if they can find a way out of a situation, they're going to find it. And they're going to leave the sheep to fend for themselves, man. So, you know, man, good hope, good, good help. It's hard to find, ain't it? <laughs> and unfortunately, man, sometimes that's true even in the church, that we want our pastors to be good hired hands and really at best that's what pastors are we're the help you don't belong to us you belong to Jesus so don't think of us too high don't think of us too low we're hired hands and we hope to be good ones and unfortunately man I think the congregation does a better job of remembering that we're the help than we do too often uh, 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 man, pastors will, will, man, they start off understanding that, man, they're, they're just a hired help, man. Like, we work on behalf of the shepherd. And then we, 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 we do stuff, man. Our churches grow, you know what I'm saying? Our weekly attendance goes up, you know what I'm saying? Our giving goes up. Uh, uh, man, a whole bunch of people maybe get baptized. Uh, uh, man, maybe we, we get a new building, all this stuff, and we get drunk off our own grapes, and we start thinking that we're more than we are. You guys don't forget it. But we do. We can. So it's not the fact that a hired hand is bad. The hired hand is supposed to be a good thing. It just needs to be good help. And so we work for the shepherd. We belong to him. Uh, any authority that we have in the church uh, is not because uh, the pastor, the, the title of pastor or title in and of itself 
uh, carries this, th- this huge authoritative weight, it's because we, we work for the shepherd. It's because in the same way that the hired help's job was to look after and tend to and care for the sheep while the shepherd was away, this is what we got going on now. The Lord Jesus Christ is raised from the dead and he's ascended to heaven and he's seated at the right hand of his father. And while the shepherd is away, he's given the sheep into the care of the under shepherds, the hired help. And by God's grace, we aspire to be good help, people that won't abandon you when things get hard or when wolves reveal themselves and come to hurt, or when thieves and robbers come to steal, kill, and destroy. So again, let's not forget, this is going back. This is, these are things Jesus is trying to convey through this illustration to these Pharisees who think they're all that, who think they're good help, but they're not, who think that they're uh, uh, gatekeepers, but they're not. This is where Jesus says, I am the gate. In verse 7, Jesus said again, truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. A thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. So, Man, these Pharisees, uh, they consider themselves gatekeepers, that they're the ones who get to decide who's in and who's out. And I, I started thinking, man, uh, uh, man, we actually have an example of a good gatekeeper in John, in John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a, was a good gatekeeper. He knew what his job was. His job, man, he, the whole time he was talking about the one who was coming after him who he's not even worthy to tie his sandals. And remember, when Jesus actually arrived on the scene, people started going to Jesus to be baptized instead of going to John, who was the Baptist or the baptizer. And some of John's disciples came to John, and they were like, man, they're they're going to see him instead of you. They were taking it personally. Like, man, how are they going to disrespect you like that, John? They're going to Jesus, man. You're the one who's been out here preaching all this time. And John is like, man, what are y'all talking about? I'm paraphrasing. He's like, that was the point the whole time. The whole, my whole job was to open the gate and let you get to the shepherd when he came for you. He did that humbly. And he looks at Jesus now engaging with his sheep, baptizing them. And he's like, man, this is so good. So John was a a good gatekeeper. Jesus comes and he's like, open the gate. Let everybody get to Jesus. And so Jesus says to these supposed gatekeepers, I am the gate. If you want eternal safety, you better be on the right side of the gate. This was the point of the pen and the gate. To keep the sheep safe from wolves and thieves and robbers and so on. If you're inside the gate, if you go through the gate and you're inside the gate, on the right side of the gate, this is where you find safety and protection and community and all that stuff. It's all if you're on the right side of the gate. And here these supposed gatekeepers are trying to keep Jesus out of the house of God. It's like, how are you going to close the gate when I'm the gate? Can't keep me out. You ain't even in. Literally right now, you're standing on the wrong side of the gate. I am the gate. Remind me of, uh, remember that old movie, Judge Dredd, when they tried to uh, charge him? When he was like, I am the law. <laughs> Classic. Good old Sylvester Stallone, man. (laughs) All right, let me keep this moving. But Jesus is the gate. Safety. Eternal security. It's all on the right side of the gate. You got to go through him. There's no other way. And if you think there is, you're a thief and a robber. And if you won't open the gate, you're a bad gatekeeper. So Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. He says it multiple times. 
He says, I'm the good shepherd. And so, man, I, I can't help but, but, but again, notice, he doesn't just say, I'm the shepherd. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I'm the good shepherd. So what's the implication? When he has to say, I'm not just a shepherd, I'm the good one, the implication is what? There are bad ones. He says, I'm not just a shepherd, I'm the good shepherd. And so to say that he's good, man, is to say that he's not bad. It's to say that he's not what they claim he is. Jesus is not a bad shepherd. He's not a thief. He's not to be counted among the robbers. And he's not to be counted among the demons, which they keep accusing him of having a demon. He's none of those things. He's a good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. That's another thing. He didn't say, I am a good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Which good shepherd? Man, the same shepherd that Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 40, when he said he protects his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them in the fold of his garment. He gently leads those that are nursing. The Bible talks about Jesus as as a shepherd, talks about the Messiah as a shepherd in the Old and New Testament. In the New Testament, it talks about him as the great shepherd in Hebrews 13. It talks about him as the chief shepherd in 1 Peter 5. It also talks talks about him as the shepherd and bishop of our souls in 1 Peter 2, 25. So which shepherd is he? He's that one. I am the good shepherd. Read the scriptures. Look for good shepherds. If you're looking for one to come, I'm him. So Jesus is the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd. I'm wrapping up. Jesus is the good shepherd. He's he's not like the hired hand who runs off when the wolf shows up. He's not like that. He's the good shepherd. Jesus says that he actually lays down his life for the sheep. He's the good shepherd. Uh, he, he, the, the good shepherd is, is not like a stranger to us, but he knows us by our names, and we know him because he's made himself known to us, and we know his voice because he's a good shepherd. Uh, uh, Jesus doesn't say to us, uh, you're free to go on your own. You guys will figure it out. But no, instead, he actually goes before us. He doesn't, lead, he doesn't round us up with sheepdogs and, and, and say, man, go off into the pasture and hopefully you'll be okay. But no, he's a good shepherd. He actually comes and gathers us. And, and, and there's nowhere that we go that he hasn't gone first to make sure that the way is clear and safe. He goes before us in every way. He's been, he's truly human. He's been tempted in every way and yet without sin, he's gone before us in temptation. And even when we think about our ultimate end that we'll all meet apart from him coming back, like all of us one day are going to die and go into the grave. And guess what? He's gone before us there too. This should be a a great source of confidence for the believer that, that there's no step that God is asking us to take that he hasn't walked before we get there, even to the grave. He went into the grave, and he popped back up three days later, better than ever, and promised us that we're going to do the same. We can walk confidently in this life, and we can even walk confidently towards our deaths, knowing that the good shepherd has gone before us and has made a way of safety, eternal safety not just for our souls, but that we'll be raised again with glorified bodies. This is the promise of the good shepherd. Jesus said, this is why the father loves him. This is verse 17. This is why the father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. I have the right to lay it down, and I have the right to take it up again. I have received this command from my father. And lastly, man, the good shepherd isn't like the Pharisees. He's not like the Pharisees who were bad shepherds to only one type of sheep. You hear that? Jesus being a good shepherd is so other compared to these false and bad shepherds who they only had one type of sheep the Jewish community, and they couldn't even be good shepherds to them. 
But Jesus is a good shepherd to all types of sheep, from all types of communities, from all types of people groups, from all over the world. And he's good to all of them. He says this in verse 16, but I have other sheep that are not from this sheep pen. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Then there will be one flock, one shepherd. Amen. And this is the good news of the gospel, y'all, that, that we serve a good shepherd. We serve a good shepherd that's good to you, that, that knows you, that seeks you out, that has made a place of eternal safety and security for you, regardless of what community you come from, regardless of what nation your, 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 your country, what, what flag your country flies. Every nation, every tribe, every tongue, the Lord Jesus Christ is a good shepherd to all who will come through the gate. Can't help but think now, you know, especially now. Like, I get it, man. You know, we have all types of distrust and unrest and, you know, we're getting into that political season where things are starting to get tense and we got to argue about everything and people that you were good brothers and sisters with for the last three and a half years, now you're going to call into question their salvation for the next six months. We're getting there. And some of this, man, is, I don't know, not accepting the fact, the fact that Jesus has sheep that Jesus is the good shepherd and that he has legitimate sheep among all peoples. You know, it's, it's it, some uh, things that the world makes like super clear cut sometimes, man. Like, like man, as Christians, we, we got to think about this a little, de- a little more deeply. Like, man, yeah, like, man, uh, <laughs> I know, like, we know, not to get too political and stuff like that, but we know, man, like, think about things like our border and who's coming through, who's coming and who's not coming and all this stuff. And I totally agree, right? We got to protect that stuff. I agree. But let's not forget that, man, there are, there are sheep. There's sheep here. There's sheep on the other side of the border. Some of the people trying to get across are sheep too. People are fighting over Israel and Palestine and all that stuff. Man, there are Palestinian sheep. There are Israeli sheep. You know, when he said every nation, tribe, he meant every. I looked it up in the Greek. Turns out every means every. (laughs) So this is important, man. This is important when we think about the day and the time and the places that we live in to understand, man, that, that God, he says, I have other sheep that are not from this pen. You can, we're right now we're in a pen. We're in the worthy redeemer pen. And you can look to your left and you can look to your right and you can see sheep. And praise God for that. But Jesus has other sheep in other pens. And it's not limited to this city. It's not limited to this nation. He has sheep all over the world in his heart. As he says, I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. There will be one flock. And one shepherd. That's going to be the reality of heaven. That's going to be the reality of the return of Christ. Is that all the different ways that we slice ourselves up will go away. And we'll be one flock in one pen following the voice of one shepherd. And if we are wise, we would do well to understand that part of that reality is already here on earth. 
It's not perfectly here. There's still there's a sense in which the kingdom has come and is still coming. And that right now, man, I'm praising God. I'm praising God for the black sheep, for the white sheep, for the American sheep, for the Canadian sheep, for the Mexican sheep, for the Jewish sheep, for the Palestinian sheep. It's all sheep. It's all one shepherd following one voice. We all know his voice. Those of us who have come through the gate. Amen? And so that's the call, man, to understand, to tell the world, to tell the world indiscriminately that there is a good shepherd. And that he is the gate and that through him and him alone, you will find safety and security for your soul. Whether you do that in the context of North Huntsville, whether God has called you to go overseas and to share it in that that context, or whether or not, again, less than ideal, but man, the nations are flooding into America. It's unfortunate the way that it's happening, but there's an opportunity to tell the nations. It's like reverse global missions. It's like, what do you mean? I get to give the gospel to the nations and I ain't got to spend $6,000 to get there? It's not waste this opportunity, bickering over politics. I want you to know none of this is in my notes, by the way. <laughs> just kind of happened. But I'm just saying, man, God is a good shepherd. He's been good to us all. Let's offer him to all of our neighbors indiscriminately. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for sending your son, the good shepherd. All of us have had experiences with different types of of shepherds. Some of us have sat under uh, 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 good uh, shepherds or, or good hired help. Some of us have um, uh, uh, maybe unfortunately uh, been under the care of thieves and robbers. Uh, but still, still, God, you've sent your son to lay down your life for the sheep. God, I pray that you help us to recognize you as the good shepherd when you appear. That when the gospel goes forth and it's, and it's beating at the door of our hearts, that we would open up, that we wouldn't uh, uh, be hard-headed and stiff-necked, but that we would recognize you and that we would follow you wherever you may lead. God, I pray that that is an encouragement to all the saints in attendance here today, that we have a good shepherd, that you've gone before us, that there's nowhere you're asking us to go, that you haven't already gone before and walked yourself. And God, I pray that this is an an invitation for people who've been wandering and, and, and feel leaderless and wondering, where is hope? Where am I supposed to go? Man, I want, I pray that after hearing this today, that they would understand that anyone who has yet to put their trust in Christ would truly believe that God has sent his son and that he's a good shepherd and that he's worthy of following. That we would, that we would find ourselves on the right side of the gate, that we would truly have a sense of the promise and of the reward and of the security and of the safety that's only found in Christ and his finished work on our behalf. So God, would you do this in our hearts? Would you encourage? Would you convict? Would you give brand new ones where that's needed?